Many researchers throughout history have concluded that there was once an advanced race of humans, which were in worldwide communication with one another. Many methods for building, religious figures, and even legends have managed to cross the oceans of Earth over its long life. But the most compelling evidence for this intelligent and extremely advanced ancient civilization is the alignments discovered in regards to ancient sites. With the use of modern technology, we have unraveled just how vast their knowledge must have been. For example, the Great Pyramid is aligned with Machu Picchu, the Nazca Lines, and Easter Island along a straight line around the center of the Earth, with a margin of error of less than one-tenth of one degree. Other sites of ancient construction that are also within one-tenth of one degree of this line include the capital city of ancient Persia, the ancient capital city of the Indus Valley, the once lost city of Petra, the ancient Sumerian city of Ur, and the temples at Angkor Wat, among many others which are just out of alignment. Many ancient ruins demonstrate that the people who constructed them had a special interest in celestial alignments and mathematics, also that they possessed a spot-on ability of judging geographical accuracies. From north to south, there is no doubt that past civilizations were involved in incredibly complex calculations and architecture. In Giza, for instance, there are many examples of attention to spatial coordinates. The Great Pyramid's faces are aligned with the four cardinal directions almost perfectly. In fact, they are less than 0.2 of a degree off perfect alignment. More and more evidence is also surfacing in regards to the suspected use of power tools. Numerous drill marks have been discovered within ancient sites over the past few years, even including evidence of misstarts from some form of high-powered tool and accidentally split stones apparently from some form of drilling. These discoveries not only confirm a past advanced ancient civilization here on Earth, but insinuates that they were in fact aware of electrical appliance and maybe even an advanced form of travel that we have yet to discover. The floor space of the Great Pyramid of Giza is approximately 3,023 feet and the height is 481 feet. Its measurements represent the northern hemisphere of the Earth on a scale of 1 to 43,200. Though controversial, some interpret this number as exactly 20 times the precessional number of 2,160, representing the precession of the Earth through 20 different zodiac constellations. Interestingly, the ancient Mayan culture was also heavily implicated within the Alignment, a civilization who displayed advanced celestial knowledge, including a deep fascination with the ages of the zodiac, with a life calendar ending around the beginning of Aquarius. Another intriguing alignment is the 6,666-kilometer mystery. The distance between various monuments, Kailash to the North Pole, Kailash to Stonehenge, Egyptian pyramids to the North Pole, Stonehenge to Devil's Tower, Stonehenge to Bermuda Triangle, Bermuda Triangle to Easter Island, and Easter Island to Tazumal are all at a precisely 6,666 kilometer from one another. Just what exactly were these ancient civilizations up to? Alexander the Great was a member of the Arjad dynasty. He was born in Pella, central Macedonia in Greece in the year 356 BC. He succeeded his father Philip II to the throne at the age of just 20 and spent most of his ruling life on continuous military campaigns through Asia and Northeast Africa. In just 10 years, by the age of 30, he had successfully created one of the largest empires of the ancient world, stretching from Greece to India. Undefeated in battle, he is widely considered history's most successful military commander. The final resting place of this Macedonian king is one of the greatest mysteries of ancient history. No one has apparently been able to locate any evidence to suggest where he could have been buried. Recently, however, archaeologists claim that the actual tomb of Alexander was discovered and that this discovery was blocked by the Greek and Egyptian governments and has been ever since. Alexander died in a mysterious death at the age of 32 in Babylon in 323 BC. He had been holding a memorial feast to honor the passing of a close friend when he suddenly suffered intense pain and collapsed. He was taken to his bedchamber where, after days of agony, he fell into a coma and died. Scholars still debate the cause of death. Alexander was embalmed and a golden chariot was built to transfer his body to the sanctuary of Amon. 
When the procession made it to the border between Syria and Egypt, it was met by Ptolemy, who stole the body. Its location along with all artifacts ever since have remained a mystery. In the early 1980s, a man named Russell Burroughs claimed he stumbled upon a hidden cave somewhere near Olney. He apparently found human remains, metal weapons, and an ancient language carved into gold tablets. Stranger still, the language was Middle Eastern and European in origin, and not from any known American Indian culture. What was astonishing about this apparent discovery was the fact that many artifacts recovered from the site strongly suggested that they were connected to the tomb of Alexander. The reason he claims his find has been covered up was realized by Virginia Hurrigan and Harry Hubbard, who upon deciphering the writings and cataloging the artifacts realized that they detailed numerous close encounters with extraterrestrial life, apparently including a specific species of reptilians. Their work, which they maintain possession of, has been disclosed across the web, with a large selection of photographic studies of said objects. Are the powers that be hiding the fact that past rulers throughout history have been in contact with beings from other planets? Many have claimed through the subsequent years that Russell Burroughs' artifacts are frauds, and he still refuses to reveal the location of the hidden cave. However, it could also be seen as a smokescreen, obscuring from public view a real find of significant historical importance. Around the same time, many archaeologists came forward claiming Liana Suvalzi to have found the elusive tomb just where it should have been all along. Yet they also claim that her discoveries were indeed covered up, and it would seem with the help of Russell Burroughs' debunked find, it was successfully concealed from the world. Just what could there be in this tomb that is such a threat to modern understanding? What could be so earth-shaking that it would lead to an international cover-up? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching guys, and until next time, take care. In 1963, NASA launched its final manned mission during the Mercury program. On board the Atlas IX rocket known as Faith 7 was pilot astronaut Gordon Cooper. Project Mercury was the first human spaceflight program of the United States, running from 1958 through 1963. An early highlight of the space race, its goal was to put a man into Earth orbit and return him safely before the Russians. Cooper's cool-headed performance and piloting skills led to a basic rethinking of design philosophy for later space missions. While Cooper was stuffed into his tiny module for 32 hours during his orbit, he was tasked with a covert mission, the results of which have only recently come to light. He was given a cutting-edge piece of long-range magnetic detection technology, which was installed into a camera on board the Faith 7 spacecraft. His mission while on board was to capture images of the globe using this sensing technology to locate any possible secret nuclear development sites which could be considered a threat to America. During this procedure, Cooper became aware of an amazing capability which the camera possessed. Not only was it sensing possible hidden bases, but was also capturing anomalies deep in the oceans of Earth. Cooper deduced that these pings were actually all the shipwrecks which dot the ocean floors from throughout history which had been spotted by the machine due to the considerable amount of metals within the wrecks. It seems having the courage to go into space, and the intelligence and reflexes to survive the experience, will endow you with some very special rewards, in the most unlikely of forms. What this mission had given to Cooper was a treasure map of Earth, which no other person could possibly possess. Cooper dutifully recorded the geographical coordinates of the anomalies as was required of him, and when he returned to Earth, he also mapped them out on a sea chart which became known as the treasure map from space, by his lifelong friend, and renowned treasure hunter, Roger Milkos. Throughout the rest of his life, Cooper would secretly compile substantial research regarding historical shipwrecks that corresponded with the locations on the space map. Cooper had planned to organize expeditions to find the treasures, but unfortunately, before he could finish his work, he died in 2004 of heart failure. Passing his map and all accompanying research to Milkos on his deathbed, now Milkos has set about finding these shipwreck treasures in a new Discovery Channel series called Cooper's Treasure. He told the press, quote, We want to bring to light the new stories of the shipwrecks that have yet to be discovered, tell the story and share it with the world, and share it with the host countries that are allowing us to do the research. What we are trying to do is to open a dialogue about the past with these host countries. End quote. I will keep you posted on any substantial finds they make. There are many places on our planet so remote or little mentioned that much of the world has never heard of said sites. 
and the Great Salbic Kurgan is one such example of an incredible ruin that has been largely forgotten or overlooked by modern academic study. Clearly of a Neolithic age, the thing which is most striking regarding the ruin is the sheer size of the megalithic blocks which make up the main structure. Claimed by many as the most majestic and mysterious ancient monument of southern Siberia, the mound is located in what is locally known as the so-called Siberian Valley of the Kings, where several thousand years ago, it is claimed that there existed a kingdom, one made up of a people once known as the Tagars. Thus, the age monument has been pinned on said culprits, with an age of around 2,300 to 2,500 years attributed to the site. The main earthwork is a stone square mound, 70 meters by 70 meters in size, as mentioned, huge slabs of Devonian sandstone. Some estimated as weighing as much as 50 to 70 tons were somehow once inexplicably delivered to the site from a quarry site of over 100 kilometers away found upon the banks of the Yenisei River. It is believed that it was an ancient temple, and at a later date an ancient astronomical observatory, which like most other Neolithic sites incorporates processional cycles in its alignment, showing the movement of the sun and the moon. As mentioned, it still remains a complete mystery as to what devices were once utilized for the importation and installation of these gigantic stones. At the corners and sides of the stone fences are deeply driven large meniers. All 23 stones are of an enormous sight. Measuring up to a height of 6 meters, they're clearly smoking guns flying in the face of upheld academic fallacies. The rare excavations and explorations noted as having been undertaken at the site note that before the construction of the giant earth embankment and its accompanying stone fence, there was a crypt of logs in its place, once in the form of a truncated pyramid. This whole crypt can be found inside the huge earthwork, preserved beneath, untouched, yet covered with a thick layer of bark. The crypt had the height of 2.5 meters in depth of 2 meters of water covered the pit. It is claimed that around the burial zone, for a long time a strong anomaly has continually been observed. The study of these phenomena has indeed been engaged by scholars, but the pace of said explorations has been suspiciously slow-paced. Who built the Great Salbic Kurgan? How were these huge stones transported to the site and once driven into the earth at the site? What is this quote, strong anomaly? More investigation and popularization of the site is desperately needed. It is a place which we find highly compelling. Thanks for watching guys and until next time, take care. Hulgoat is a popular destination with tourists and holidaymakers alike. This is due to its impressive natural setting, among which the vestiges of an ancient forest still survive, one that once covered the entire island of Brittany. Once part of royal and ducal lands, the forest is now overseen by the French Forestry Commission, the National Forest Office. It has a footprint of around 10 square kilometers, with a large replanting scheme repairing much of the damage sustained by the forest and storms, which occurred upon the 15th and 16th of October 1987, when 3.1 square kilometers of trees were leveled or damaged. However, within this surviving ancient forest, ancient Neolithic ruins can be found. Ruins synonymous with many other countries around the world, as if made by a people who were simply motivated by aesthetics, thus creating stunning, yet equally baffling structures, which we have come to know as dolmens. However, although in some areas of Earth these can be attributed to past dwellings, many of them which survive were created with such small base stones or such large roof stones, that arguing that creating them for any other reason but their creation continues to be just as puzzling an explanation as the techniques that were once seemingly harnessed which enabled our purportedly Stone Age ancestors the ability to pick up ancient megaliths of such enormous scales. Le Champignon, or the mushroom located within the forest, is but one example of these mystifying, unarguably Neolithic formations, once created with a roof stone of many tons of weight, yet any logical argument as to the past purpose of these stone structures remains just as elusive to explain as how these incredibly ancient people somehow once accomplished such feats. Who were the Neolithics? 
How can their ruins be located all over the world, yet not attributed to a group in communication with each other? We feel the evidence to support this postulation is all but overwhelming, yet continually denied as a possibility, or even considerable as a reality by any field which is in defense of current rigidly defended fallacies, claiming that such groups were primitive and lacked the ability to cross continents. Yet the evidence in defense of this, found on almost every continent on Earth which we feel is obvious proof of a conspiracy. Regardless of this and the denial of them having links with other countries, we find the ruins which still survive within this ancient wood within Brittany as highly compelling. Roman engineers have been attributed and indeed claimed many ruins as their own in which they were simply incapable of creating. Yet they seemingly hijacked a number of sites which we have continued to claim were not their works. The Patera pipes being one such example. Yet alas, although we claimed that the ruin was pre-Roman, our next subject of interest we feel unarguably supports said posit as not only was the creation claimed as having been conceived by the Romans, but these sites, often the only surviving example, thus is also often argued as the first creation in regards to said concept. Yet although these are often claimed as first attempts, Many of the ruins were of such perfected accuracy that not only are they still functional today, but could still serve modern man's purpose. The Patera Aqueduct system, which in fact includes several examples of this ingenious solution to hilly areas in regards to water transportation, places in which the topography of the land makes bridge building an impossible task, forcing the engineers to think of a solution. With the site in question being such an innovation, now known as an inverted siphon, the one we are focusing on tonight is Delic Kemmer, near Patera, undoubtedly connected to the incredible ancient relic that is the Patera pipes. An inverted siphon being a pressurized water conduit. One end sits at a higher elevation than the other, with the center of the structure being the lowest point. The Delikemmer siphon, which was apparently renovated following an earthquake in the 1st century CE, is built out of stone blocks laid across the top of an impressive several hundred foot long wall. Piping holes were then artistically carved out of blocks of stone, which were fitted into each other and ten apparently sealed to create a watertight channel. Thus, due to the system being closed off and pressurized, when water flowed into the higher end, it was forced through the system and subsequently across the valley. The inverted siphon allowed the aqueduct to cross lower elevations, forcing the flow against gravity at certain points. Yet the most compelling detail of the site, and the one we perceive as a smoking gun supporting our prior posit and confirming that this was in fact the work of a past highly advanced yet now lost civilization is the polygonal stonework which can be found within the walls of the structure, a type of blockwork construction found all over the world yet denied as being connected, just like that of the Neolithic ruins we often share here on the channel, that regardless of the similarities in ruins throughout nearly every continent are actively denied as having once been the work of the same group. Kate Clow, an explorer behind popularization of Turkey's Lycian Way hiking trail, described the blocks in a Turkish newspaper title, Hurriyet Daily News, quote, The system was designed for easy maintenance. If you examine the fallen blocks, you will find occasional ones with top holes bored into them. These were for cleaning out deposits and must have been sealed with a plug when the pipe was filled with water. There were also occasional stones where the socket cutout was extended so that a stone could be slipped out of the pipeline. Without this provision, replacing a faulty stone would have been impossible, as the blocks interlock completely. The pipe joints have traces of a lime cement used initially to seal them. However, the whole pipe is now thickly lined with a deposit of pink lime from the water inside it, and this must have quickly sealed any remaining leaks between the stones." End quote. Who built the reverse siphon and the entire aqueduct as a whole? It is a place which we find highly compelling. Thanks for watching, guys, and until next time, take care. The Forager Population Paradox Along with a number of other paradoxes found in a number of academic fields of research, is now finally rediscovering much regarding our past, vindicating proof of what we have long argued is still hidden. In many areas, 
buried under meters of earth, or virtually impenetrable forests, chapters of lost human history lay waiting to be found, which due to our research into similarities and differentiating factors within unexplained ruins, at least three advanced civilizations once lost, we claim are now finally being rediscovered. Geological research has proven again and again, through the dating of many natural processes, the submergence of land masses, along with studies into erosion rates. Along with carbon radiation dating, many ruins, once claimed as a mere few thousand years old, have inadvertently, regardless of the subsequent conservative attempts at dating these zones, are now shown to have been undeniably far older. Yet the forager population paradox is scientific evidence which demonstrates that human civilizations did indeed once experience a global catastrophe. Known by many names, the Great Flood, the Great Deluge, Rapture, along with many other names in many ancient texts found all around the world. Only a paradox due to it not fitting with a paradigm. Population growth is a science which can accurately track the history and indeed ancestral origins and age of a species. Yet there lay a problem with the study of human population in particular. At some point within a now forgotten history, the human race experienced an event which reset our population growth. It would seem that even the great effort of bending carbon datings, which we allege are dishonest agings of ancient ruins and the civilizations that built them, was still not conservative enough to hide this truth. Once a thriving ancient population seemingly vanished. Data supported, or rather corroborated by the many unfinished and destroyed ancient relics we often discuss on our channel. According to the proceedings of National Academy of Science USA, in a research project titled Periodic Catastrophes Over Human Evolutionary History Are Necessary to Explain the Forager Population Paradox, they state, and I quote, Investigating multiple demographic scenarios in a large sample of human and chimpanzee populations, we find that periodic catastrophes, combined with plausible fertility or mortality reductions, can reasonably generate zero population growth. Our findings bolster arguments about the role of intergenerational cooperation in supporting the colonizing potential of human populations once released from catastrophes." End quote. Simply put, the only way to explain the population growth or lack of at certain points of our species' history in comparison to its persistently claimed age, the paradox, or the current population, proves that we did indeed experience catastrophe. An event long denied as ever being experienced by our species, with the last acceptably permitted event, K2 having been experienced only by the dinosaurs. We find the data, the paradox, and the methodological truths it exhibits highly compelling. There are many ancient monuments found all over the Earth which possess extraordinarily precise solar and lunar alignments. Ingenious designs, often many thousands of years old, constructed from stones, sometimes quarried, cut, and transported to the sites from many miles away. This movement of megaliths was accomplished using techniques or technology as yet not understood, and to date, many of these megalithic stone placements are perceived as near-impossible feats of ancient engineering. And although many impressive examples of monuments which track the sun can be found to have originated from many different civilizations, the most notable of antiquity, most famous for a seemingly obsessive level of monuments devoted to the observing of the sun's path, was undoubtedly the Neolithics. One has to wonder, why was there such a fixation? Was the motivation for this mass of undertakings of a tragic nature? Was it out of fear? Fear created by a memory of a catastrophic event, possibly involving the sun's powerful emittance of radiation. Maybe they experienced the consequences of an ancient warming cycle. We may never know. Yet the most important question in our field is not why these volumes of solar-aligned relics were created, but how. How did our ancient ancestors, 
claimed as having existed over 10,000 years ago, construct such precisely positioned granges, hinges, barrows, and sun daggers – something we have previously covered – an incredible type of sundial, which tracked a sunspot across the wall of an ancient cave, with each month, solstice and new year, precisely marked out across the walls. Yet the sundials in question in this video are a group of far more familiarly designed dials, left by the Neolithics. These sun-tracking dials can be found across the Neolithic sites of Ireland, Scotland, Orkney, and England. First discovered by an American by the name of Martin Brennan, a 39-year-old from New York. Not only did he discover the true function of curbstones located in Noth, codename K7, K15 among others. He also cracked the earliest form of writing while studying the Irish Stone Age artwork. Earlier this year, a theory emerged on the internet by writer and journalist Ben Gagna. He suggested that there was an image of a swan on curbstone 15 at Nonth. He claimed that while examining a photo he had taken of K15, he flipped it upside down and saw something no one had ever seen before – the faint but unmistakable image of a swan in profile. The true meaning or purpose of the curbstones had for a long time been heavily debated within certain circles. The intriguing cup and ring marks had been known of for some time. Yet as previously mentioned, though the most popular theory of the design on K15 was the claim that it was the depiction of a swan glyph, this hypothesis was rejected even before Martin's unarguably accurate translation was discovered. Martin identified the sundial while examining a passage mount in the Boyne Valley. And although sundials thousands of years old have been excavated throughout Europe, many specialist individuals reviewing Martin's finds believe that the sundial discovered in County Meath is the oldest and possibly most important ever found. According to Martin, who has been studying megalithic Irish art for the last 10 years, Ireland's megalithic tombs are suffering from appalling neglect. Some of the most important passage mounds excavated previously have been ignored or, conveniently, completely sealed up. Martin's discoveries are undoubtedly remarkable and are of tremendous value to our ongoing deciphering of ancient antiquity and its past civilizations. It is a journey of discovery we find highly compelling. Rising nearly 400 feet above the desert floor, in a remote section of New Mexico within ancient Anasazi territory, is a place named Chaco Canyon, and within stands an imposing natural structure called Fajada Butte. Hidden from the world for over 700 years, along a precarious narrow ledge, there lay a secret, ancient, astronomical observatory. Subsequently given the name Sun Dagger, and the reason why is nothing less than remarkable, it has been revealed that for more than a thousand years, the sun dagger has been revealing to all aware of its creation the subtle changing of the seasons. In 1977, it was thankfully rediscovered when rock art and petroglyphs were spotted nearby. Anna Sofer, who was cataloging the rock art, was one morning greeted by the sun dagger, slowly traveling across the wall, traversing the strange spiral patterns which were etched upon them. The intelligent Anna realized that the sun dagger could have been connected to the petroglyphs, so along with her colleagues, she came back at various dates throughout the year, eventually establishing the following information. On the summer solstice, the sun dagger appears near the top of the largest spiral, and over a period of 18 minutes it slices through the very center, cutting the spiral in half before leaving it in shadow for another year. On the winter solstice, two daggers of light appear lasting for 49 minutes, during which they frame the large spiral. Finally, an equally fascinating and more complex light show occurs on the spring and autumn equinoxes. The large spiral is carved in such a way that counting from the center outward to the right, there are nine grooves. On each equinox, a dagger of light appears that cuts through the spiral on different angles. Meanwhile, a second dagger slices through the center of the smaller spiral. These light shows, which had been going on for centuries, continued for several years after their rediscovery. However, in 1989, it was found that the granite slabs had shifted. The alignments that had been arranged so carefully were no more. 
It also seems impossible for us modern people to realign them as all attempts have failed. Was this sun dagger really made by the Anasazi Indians? Or was it a far older surviving relic, one that they were merely aware of? A relic which has unfortunately eroded away? Similar ancient light displays marking the solstices and equinoxes can be found at other locations as well, such as in the southwestern United States and Mexico. In a ruin in Hovenweep National Monument, near the borders of Utah and Colorado, light beams also illuminate spiral petroglyphs on the summer solstice. At Burrow Flats in Southern California, a winter solstice sun points a finger of light to the center of five concentric rings in an early Chumash rock art display. Were these monuments once used by a lost, ancient advanced group of marauders as calendar sites while traveling America? Perhaps one day we will know for sure. Thanks for watching guys, and until next time, take care.